And welcome to another episode of Ramadan with MTA. In this program, which is exclusively being aired during weekdays in the blessed month of Ramadan, we bring you different segments. Speaking about verses of the Holy Quran, speaking about narrations of the Holy Prophet وسلم, as well as bringing you some cooking segments and introducing books, we also have a health segment. So let's start with our first segment for today, which is the recitation of the Holy Quran. Let's take a listen. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد خلقناكم ثم صورناكم ثم قلنا للملائكة اسجدوا لآدم فسجدوا فسجدوا إلا إبليس لم يكن من الساجدين. And we did create you, and then we gave you shape. Then said we to the angels, Submit to Adam. And they all submitted, but Iblis did not. He would not be of those who submit. Like in every episode, we invite a guest uh, here into the studio to talk us through some of the questions that we have, to explain some of the questions that we have, and to um, have a you know, brief discussion about some of the topics that we are talking about. Today, we have with us here in the studios, Daniel Kalu Sahib, Rabbi Sisla, Aslam Alaikum, Rabbi Sahib, and Jazakallah, first of all, for joining us today. So in this verse of Surah Al-Araf that we've just listened, Allah Ta'ala is talking about um, the creation of Adam and you know the subsequent events that took place after that. I want to ask you, so this is probably a big misconception, not just within the Muslim um, nation, but also you know people of different faiths, because the concept of Adam is something that we find in different religions as well. How did all of this occur? Was it in heaven? Was it um, here on earth? Is that something that people believe and how much of that is, is actually true? Yes, Mr. So, so your question is correct in the sense that it's a huge misconception across the board, you know, and across um, various religions as well, uh, where most people generally are of the mind that this all happened in heaven. God created Adam in heaven or a place like heaven. It was like, it's pretty much heaven, not the earth yeah. that we're living in at the moment. But in order to answer this, we don't even need to look far. We need to look at the Holy Quran because this is the beauty of the Holy Quran that it provides the commentary of its own verses in, in many instances. And uh, it has done so in this regard as well, where in uh, chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 31, God Almighty states, that God said to the angels that I'm about to place a vice gerund in the earth, you know, ardi, in the earth. And that completely dispels the notion that this happened in heaven. <laughs> End of story. We don't even need to go into it that much, you know. And uh, one important point here is that uh, we can even l roughly locate the, the region where this all occurred. Because ahadith, who also serve, which also serve as commentaries to the Holy Quran in some instances, uh, point to the fact that when the Holy Prophet وسلم, went on his uh, journey of Miraj, um, in heaven, he saw four rivers. Two were those of heaven, and two were uh, the Euphrates and the Tigris riv mm. rivers of Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq. Wow. So he saw those two rivers, you know, again in heaven per se, but they are on earth. So has that Adam alayhi salam, and all of this, whatever happened here, uh, actually happened within that region on this very earth that we're living in. Wonderful. So that clarifies it. And one more question, if you allow. <clears throat> A very basic question, I know, but it's still being talked about, still needs some clarification. Was Hazrat Adam the first man or not? Because 
even if I pitch this idea to someone, science is telling me something completely different. So what, what does Islam say about well, this? Well, here's the thing, right? Many, again, it's a huge misconception. Many, many people, many theists believe that Hazrat Adam Islam, was the very first human being. And like you said, it doesn't conform with modern science. But there's no contradiction for us. That's the beauty of it. Because as I mentioned the verse before, the earlier in mm -hmm. Surah Al-Baqarah, that God Almighty mentioned the word Khalifa. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, right? That I'm going to create a khalifa. What does khalifa mean? It means successor. What does that mean? He must have had predecessors, right? Yes. So there must have been humans before, right? It, it, again, it's so simple. We don't even need to look any, anywhere else. It's common sense. Yeah. And the verse in question that we're discussing today, which was recited beautifully just now, even that proves it in the sense that it uses the plural for Arabic of you. It says khalaqnaakum. We created you, plural, mm. not uh, you know, khalaqnaaka, that we created you, just, just the one person. Sawarnaakum, mm. you know, we gave you shape, plural again, you know. And then after creation and everything, then it says thumma, then we told the angels to, um, you know, prostrate before Adam. And even that, that's another discussion, what kind of prostration was it, yeah. you know, it wasn't physical prostration because only we can prostrate towards God so Almighty. if he wasn't the first yeah. man, who was he then? Why, 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 where does this misconception come from? Then? Interesting question. Here's the thing, right? There have been many Adams, right? But this Adam, Islam, specifically being spoken about in these verses, is the Adam who appeared 6,000 years ago, right? So we believe that. We believe that he was that Adam 6,000 years ago. But we don't necessarily believe, and science is in conformity with this, that that Adam 6,000 years ago was the father of say the Aborigines of Australia, mm. or the Native Americans of America, or the Sub-Saharan Africans, you know? There is no resemblance, and scientifically it's not possible either. Yes, there could have been one originating Adam all the way back when humanity started, yes. who, through whom all the children of Adam came from, but this specific Adam was the father of Noah salam, of Abraham salam, of Yaqub and Ishaq salam, and all of the prophets. So this is where prophethood, this is the first prophet that we are talking about. Not Absolutely. the first human, but the first prophet. Exactly, first That's prophet. That's what it is. Yeah. Daniel Jazakumullah stands up for that. Now with that, we're going to move to the next segment and that is uh, we're going to present a narration of the Holy Prophet wasalam, to you and then have a short discussion on that. Here is the Hadith. An Jabirin Qal قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أعطيت خمسا لم يعطهن أحد قبلي نصرت بالرعب مسيرة شهر وجعلت لي الأرض مسجدا وطهورا وأحلت لي الغنائم ولم تحل لأحد قبلي وأعطيت الشفاعة وكان النبي يبعث إلى قومه خاصة وبعثت إلى الناس عامة Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, narrates that the Holy Prophet, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said I have been granted five distinctions which none of the prophets were granted before me. Firstly, I have been reinforced with awe extending as far as a month's journey. Secondly, the entire earth has been made for me a mosque and a means of purity. Thirdly, the booty of war has been made lawful for me. It was never made lawful before me. Fourthly, I have been granted the honour of intercession with the Lord. And fifthly, while prophets before me were commissioned to their particular people, I have been sent to the entire mankind. All right, Jazakallah for that. Daniel Saab, I want to run down through those five distinctions one more time for the benefit of our, listener, uh, of our viewers before we get into one more question, if you allow. So if you could do that, please. Right, so these five distinctions, which um, you know, have been briefly described by the Holy Prophet they can be further expanded upon in the sense that, firstly, we have awe, we have rob, right? How was the Holy Prophet وسلم, granted awe? We can see an example in his life where he sent letters to various kings and rulers. One letter was sent to Caesar. Now, bear in mind, this was the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, the emperor of the superpower of the time. When he received the letter, his response to that letter was that 
if I could, you know, if I physically could, I would make my way to that prophet and I would wash his feet. Mm. That was the awe that was inspired just through a letter of the Holy Prophet mm. Number two, we have that the whole earth is a masjid and this really points towards the fact that Islam is a universal religion meant for the entirety of mankind and the entire world. You know, and even, you know, the earth is pure for us. That's proven uh, again in an Islamic act where if you can't find water for ablution, you can use the earth for taymum, yeah. exactly. And number three was war booty. And that's um, become lawful in order to prevent national wealth from being wasted, which was being done in the past a lot. And it's, it also serves as a deterrent to potential aggressors. Mm -hmm. When they know that their wealth can potentially end up in the hands of the Muslims, they think twice before, yeah. you know, acting. Uh, fourthly, we have shifat, which means intercession on the Day of Judgment. That's just self-explanatory. The Holy Prophet ﷺ would intercede on behalf of his uh, ummah. And number five, um, now this, you know, this pretty much points towards a universal mi mission. It's the same way that there is one God for this entire creation, there is one Prophet hmm. who is universal for all of mankind. Wonderful. Zakala for that. Now that we know these five distinctions, I want to ask you, in the beginning of the hadith, the Holy Prophet ﷺ says that this is something that has never been granted to any Prophet before me. Why? Well, the reason for that is because, let's look at the nature of ahadith first. The ahadith or the narrations of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, the authenticity of them can be established through the Holy Qur'an. Very simple. If it's in conformity with the Holy Qur'an, we accept it. If it goes against the Holy Qur'an, we don't accept it. Now this hadith, it is in conformity with the Holy Qur'an because we have various verses where the Holy Prophet's وسلم, status is mentioned. There's one verse, for example, in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 108, where God Almighty says, rajim, wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen, that we have not sent thee but as a mercy for all people. And in another verse, this is Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 41, God Almighty states, He's He is the seal of the prophets, you know, he's, best. he's the best of the best and that's it. And those verses, they prove the authenticity of that statement of the Holy Prophet So it's not exactly the Holy Prophet saying it, it's actually God, you know, saying it. Wonderful. Jazakallah for that, Daniel Sahib. And um, a reminder to our viewers at home, these ahadiths, again, have been taken from the book 40 Gems of Beauty by Hazrat Zabashir Ahmed Sahib, who has compiled 40 ahadiths of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu given the translation as well as a little bit of an explanation. So if you want to go back and read them for yourself in your free time, which is probably the best time during the month of Ramadan, um, then you can go to Al-Islam or you can get the physical copy, the hard copy, in a bookshop near you. With that, we're going to uh, go to our next segment and that is the cooking segment. Today we're going to go to the MT International Studios in the USA and I believe it's an okra soup which is being prepared today. Let's take a look. as alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we will be cooking a traditional Nigerian dish called okra soup or ila asipo. And we have several ingredients that go into the, the dish. We have blended crayfish, we have shrimp, which is fresh. We have the goat meat as well as the beef and the cow skin. We have the smoked fish and smoked mackerel. And we have spices, which is curry, salt, and bunion cubes. We have the locust beans here, red oil, and the fresh peppers, which is bell pepper, onions, scotch bonnet, and ginger. And the main, to eat with the okra soup, you have the yam flour, which we'll be making alongside. So when we have our meat here, we are going to wash it and make sure it's properly clean so that we can boil it. And this is the beef. So we place all of the meat in the pot so that that way that can begin boiling on the stove. And now I'm going to rinse the cow skin. The cow skin are a bit bigger, so that I will be chopping to get it smaller to help in the cooking of them. And once it's, once it's cut into little pieces, it gets washed once again, just so that that way we get all the extra infiltrations out. Once the cow skins are clean, we place them in the pot 
And then we add some onions to help boil when we're boiling it. And we're going to add some salt, just a pinch. And then we use our hands to marinate it so that that way the salt can absorb. And then we chop some onions or slice some onions rather into the meat. You can also put some bean cubes. Another ingredient that we like to put in is some ginger. And what the ginger does is softens the meat during cooking. And we just slice and dice. And then we cover it and we put it on the stove. So the meat mixture is on the stove. I'm just going to put a tad bit of water in there so that that way um, it can steam. While this is cooking, I will go ahead and start chopping the okra. They have been washed and we chop them up so that that way it will be easier to, to cook. As you can see, it's nice and small. So next what I will be doing is blending the fresh vegetables, which is the bell pepper, the, the scotch bonnet, the onions, and the ginger. And this would be the base of the okra soup today. I'm gonna to add a little bit of water. And we are going to blend it into a nice consistency. Because there isn't a whole lot of water in there, blend a little bit and then stir it up. So you have a nice consistency of the scotch bonnet, the bell pepper, the ginger, and the onions. So the next thing I will be doing is making the base for the uh, meat to go into, and that consists of the red oil. You put the pan on low medium heat, and you wait for the oil to thin out a little bit. We only want the locust beans to be in for about 30 seconds, within 30 seconds and a minute, just so that that way it can, it will not get burnt. So the next thing I will be doing is adding the blended pepper. And we're going to fry this for about 10 minutes. So this is the curry that we're adding. And we're adding just one vineyard cube. And then we stir it. So I will be taking the meat out of the pot. It should be well soft now. I'm going to add the fresh shrimp to the mixture. I'm also going to add the beef. And then we let it marinate for a little bit. Now we can add this mixture into the bigger pot. We do ha still have a little bit in here, just so that we have more space. So we're going to be adding the smoked fish. And this is just a smoked macro that I'm adding now. So what we do is we cover this for about five minutes and we put the stove on high so that that way it will simmer well. Okay, so this is the mixture of all of the beef, the sauce, the broth, and now I will be adding the last ingredient, which is the crayfish. And I'm just gonna add just a little bit to add additional um, flavor to the dish. And I'll stir that up, and then I will be adding the chopped okra. And this is the pretty much the last thing that we do is add the okra to the dish. And we stir it. Now look at that. And I'll be lowering the, the light under it so that, that we can simmer. 
So we're going to leave this to simmer for about five more minutes so that, that way it can steam. So now I will be making the yam flour, which is the pounded yam. Okay, I have boiling water here. This is the powder. And you just put that in there. You stir as you put. And you want to continue to stir to make sure that the consistency changes. You also don't want it to be too hard, hence the adding of the water. And then I'm going to plate that. Okay, everyone, this is the completed okra soup with all the ingredients that we spoke of earlier. This here is the pounded yam, um, individual serving here. We have the, the soup here, you can, it's all individual, however you like. And bon appetit, enjoy. Jazakallah for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the studio. I certainly never had an okra soup, but there's always a first time for everything done here. So it looked healthy, to be honest, and I'm sure some of our viewers will find it beneficial. We'll try it definitely in the month of Ramadan or even after that. We're going to swiftly move on to the next segment, and I see the book on the table that you have in front of you. The 10 Proofs for the Existence of God is the book that we're introducing today. Very briefly, what is this book all about? Sure. So this is a book by Hazrat Muslim Hadrazil Anhu, the second Khalifa of uh, the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam. And in the words of Hazrat Muslim Hadrazil Anhu, actually, I think th this would be more, um, you know, powerful. He states in the book, modernity has eradicated the concept of the holy God from the hearts of most of our youth. So this was the intention behind um, publishing this book, that because people, especially the youth, are turning away from God Almighty. And this was, mind you, you know, 60, 70, 80 yeah. years ago. And we're living in this modern era and, you know, it's more applicable even yeah. now, right? So um, the beauty of this book is, that, as the name suggests, it's 10 proofs. And those proofs, as a Muslim out states, that his belief and conviction is so firm in the Holy Quran that he has only used the Holy Quran and verses from the Holy Quran to provide those 10 proofs of the existence of God. Wow. So, can you give us one? Sure. One of the examples um, or one of the arguments presented by Hazrat Muslim in this book, uh, is that, you know, um, he, he poses us this question. He says that if God does not exist, then why do we differentiate between mothers and sisters with regards to incestuous relationships, mm. right? What is it that tells us not to go about it? What is it that tells us uh, that deceit and lying is wrong, right? And he further goes on to explain that you know, even punishment and reward are meted out within this world, right? We don't even need to wait for the Day of Judgment. Take, for example, adulterers, right? The chances of an adulterous couple contracting uh, an STD, right, syphilis or gonorrhea or whatever, are so much higher than a married couple, hmm. you know, statistically speaking. What does that tell you? That those adulterers are being punished, right? That's like, that's a huge, you know, that's a huge point in favour of you know, the existence of God. And the verse that as a Muslim uh, brings in this argument is of the Billah min shaitan al-Rajim, la uqusimu bi yawm al-Qiyamah wa la uqusimu bin nafs al And nafs al is the key word here, that the self-accusing soul, we all have it within us. We all have that inner voice that tells us, no, you know, that act is wrong, or no, such speech is wrong, we shouldn't go about this, mm. right? And Hazul says that even atheists recognize that adultery and lying and everything is, is wrong as well. And another verse of the Holy Quran also um, points towards this. You know that God Almighty revealed to it what is wrong for it and what is right for it. And as you can see from that book, Daniel Sab, if you want to hold it up, it's a very small, very um, tiny book. And it can be probably read within a day, if not within an hour or two. And highly, highly recommended, especially as Hazrat Muslim al who laid it out in the beginning for the youth, addressing the youth specifically. And as you said, it couldn't be more useful today um, with all of the things that are happening around us with religion, and the concept of religion, the concept of belief in God actually just slowly, slowly um, disappearing from the societies that we live in, unfortunately. Now, we're going to move on to our uh, next segment, and that is the homeopathy and well-being segment. Uh, Atik Bhatti Sahib is going to talk about mental exhaustion today and what remedies you can find in the field of homeopathy. Let's take a look. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to homeopathy and well-being. 
Now, in today's episode, we cover mental overstrain. So what are the symptoms of being mentally overstrained? Well, some of them include tiredness, general fatigue, forgetfulness, general lethargy, so not wanting to do anything, just feeling a bit down, weakness, procrastination, procrastination becoming very common nowadays, where you have tasks to do, but you're just disinclined to do them, and the slightest task causing tiredness. These are all symptoms or possible symptoms of mental fatigue. So what are the causes? Well, mental fatigue can be brought on by a number of things. Stress, anxiety, worries. These can be day-to-day -day worries. These can be worries that have been prolonged, um, chronic worries that you've been going through. Now, the prolonged period of use of electronic devices like mobile phone and tablets can also cause mental fatigue because the eyes and the brain can become very, very tired. There is, remember, only so much information we can all process in any one day. But always remember, if mental fatigue is serious or you feel that it's not becoming better, always check with a medical professional. So, what are the treatments in homeopathy for mental fatigue? There are a number of very effective remedies. The first one is a remedy called Califos, and this is a very effective nerve remedy and a nerve stimulant. Phosphoric acid is another remedy, as is picric acid, and gelsemium, which you have mentioned in a few episodes now. Gelsemium is very much a polycrest remedy, which means that it's indicated for more than one symptom or one ailment. Very effective indeed. Aconite is commonly used for mental fatigue. This is very much associated to uh, the sudden onset um, of mental fatigue, perhaps due to some sort of anxiety. But the combination of Califos, Acid Fos and Picric Acid, taken in a potency three times a day, works wonders and can sometimes work after just a few doses. I hope that's been useful to you. Until next time, Jazakallah. Jazakallah to Dr. Atik Bhatti Sahib, our homeopathy consultant, for tips and tricks uh, how homeopathy can help us deal with mental exhaustion. Jazakallah to Bhatti Sahib once more. And Daniel Sahib, Jazakallah to you as well. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here in the studio and Jazakallah for answering our questions. And also thank you very much to our viewers at home. That was it from all of us here at the MT International Studios and the Ramadan with MTA show. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. <laughs> Sada